Hello and welcome back to Linear Algebra. The video series where, for example, we learn to solve systems of linear equations. And indeed, related to that is something we will talk about today in part 38. Namely, I will explain how the solution set for such a system looks like. However, you already know, before we start with the maths content, I really want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. Now, as already mentioned, today we will talk about the set of solutions for systems of linear equations. And you know, we always write a system as a matrix vector multiplication. Hence, Ax is equal to b denotes the whole system and now we search for solutions x. So more concretely, this means we search for explicit vectors we can put into the system. And then this vector we could call x tilde should solve the system. And this just means if you multiply a with x tilde, we actually have the equality with b. So you see, this is not so complicated, but maybe we visualize that again with a picture. For this, please recall, as always, and for the rest of this video, a is an m times n matrix. Therefore, the corresponding linear map fa goes from Rn into Rm. For all calculations, this is always important to keep in mind, such that you have the correct dimensions involved. So in particular, x tilde has n components and b on the right hand side has m components. Hence, here in our picture, we can just put two dots for the two elements. Okay, and now I can tell you that we have learned in former videos that the range of a is a subspace on the right hand side. Therefore, we can conclude that the solution set is empty if b does not lie in the range of a. So, you can remember, the range of a already tells us about the existence of solutions. Okay, but now if indeed b lies in the range of a, we know there exists at least one x tilde, such that x tilde is mapped by f a to b. However, you might remember that here on the left hand side, we find the kernel of a as a subspace as well. And in fact, exactly this kernel here can be used to find more solutions. Actually, in this video, we will prove that the set of solutions looks exactly like this. So what I mean, it's a so-called affine subspace. However, at this point, you can already remember two important facts for the solutions. On the one hand, it's needed for the existence that b is an element in the range of a. Because otherwise, we cannot hit b at all. And on the other hand, the uniqueness for a solution we can only have if the kernel is trivial. Which means it's the smallest possible subspace, so just the zero vector. Okay, with that in mind, let's write down that the set of solutions is indeed an affine subspace. And this will be the important proposition of this video today. So this is easy to state. For a system, given as the equation ax is equal to b, the set of solutions, which we will denote by an s, is a so-called affine subspace. So maybe you remember this term from part 6, it's just a shifted linear subspace. However, we will also write it down in this proposition again. But before we do that, I first want to define the set of solutions in a formal way. So we can describe it as the set of all elements x tilde on the left hand side. This means with n components. With the property, if you put x tilde into the system, it solves it. So not so complicated, of course, this is what we mean by solutions. Okay, now back to the affine subspace. What do we mean here? Indeed, we should make it more concrete, because we already know it can also happen that the solution set is just the empty set. Therefore, this would be the first case, either we have that S is the empty set, or we have the more interesting case that S is a translated subspace. And in fact, we can write it down as a fixed vector v0 plus a subspace. And you might already guess, this subspace is indeed the kernel of A. Please recall, this is exactly how we imagined it in the picture above. 
Okay, so now the only thing missing is maybe the explanation what this notation with the plus sign actually means. It's a vector plus a subspace for denoting a so-called affine subspace. So in short, I can just tell you it denotes a set with the elements of this form. This means you have an element v0 plus an element x0 where x0 comes from the kernel of a. Hence, it's the whole set with elements of this form. Indeed, this is a common notation for such an affine subspace. Simply because you immediately see that you have an ordinary subspace that is translated by one vector v0. Hence, that is what you can remember, an affine subspace is just a translated linear subspace. Okay, and now I want to write down the proof of this proposition. So, now in the case that the set of solutions S is not the empty set, we can assume that at least one vector v0 exists. This means now, in the case that at least one solution exists, we can show that S is of this form. Therefore, the first conclusion we can make here is that a v0 is equal to b. Because that's the definition of S, that's the definition of being a solution of the system. And now we will define a new vector, which we can call x tilde. This should not be a surprise, we define it as v0 plus x0. However, for the moment, x0 is just an arbitrary vector in Rn. Because with this definition, we now have to show that x tilde is a solution if and only if x0 lies in the kernel of A. In other words, by using this definition here, we now have to show an equivalence. And we start on the left hand side that x tilde is an element of S. So this means this is equivalent for x tilde solving the system. More precisely, A multiplied with x tilde is equal to the vector B. However, now here on the left hand side, we can just substitute x tilde with the definition. And then it's not a surprise that we can use the linearity here. Or in other words, we use the distributive law for the matrix vector multiplication. So on the left hand side, we then have a times v0 plus a times x0. And of course, the right hand side we don't change at all. Now at this point, we can use what we know namely that a times v0 is equal to b. Hence, there's also the vector b on the left hand side. Therefore, in the next step, we can simply subtract it on both sides. And then the only thing that remains is a times x0 is equal to the 0 vector. And at this point, please recall that this is by definition exactly the property that x0 lies in the kernel of a. And there we have it, this is our last equivalence we need. So you should see, with this equivalence left and right hand side here, we have shown the equality of both sets there. So we can mark that this ends our proof. Okay, so now we can remember this is indeed a big deal because for any system, for any system of linear equations, we now know how the set of solutions S looks like. You just need one solution v0 and the knowledge of the kernel of A to get the whole set S. And moreover, because of that, we also know that row operations will not change the set of solutions S. There, please recall that in the last video, we have discussed a lot of different row operations for a system of linear equations. Indeed, this is a very important statement because it means we can use row operations to make our system simpler. Indeed, there is no huge proof needed for this fact because we already know everything. For example, we already know that we don't change the kernel of A with row operations. In fact, every invertible matrix M from the left will not change the kernel of A. And on the other hand, if V0 solves the system with A, it also solves the system with ma. More precisely, if a v0 is equal to b, you can just multiply both sides with m. So in summary, we see with row operations we don't change this particular solution here and we also don't change the kernel, which means we don't change the set of solutions at all. Therefore, using row operations is the perfect manipulation for a system in order to find the set of solutions. 
Hence, this idea will lead us to the algorithm we already know by name, it's the Gaussian elimination. In all details, we will discuss it in the next video, but we already know it has to give us three parts. First, it has to tell us if B is actually an element of the range of A or not. This is important because if this is not the case, we are already finished because we know the set of solutions is empty. Okay, then in the other case, we know there is at least one solution of the system, hence our algorithm here should give us a particular solution. And this one is the vector v0 from before. And finally, the last ingredient we should get here is the kernel of A. Indeed, we will see that the Gaussian elimination will give us a basis for the kernel of A. And with this, we have everything, then the system is solved because we can write down the set S. Okay, then I would say, let's do that in the next video. Have a nice day and see you there. Bye.